to uh, be able to share with you from the Word of God. I'd like you to turn with me, if you've got your Bibles there, to Psalm 22, and I'm going to read the first 21 verses, and uh, we'll consider them together. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. I hope you can follow along okay, and uh, beginning in verse 1, it says this, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. It's very appropriate uh, on this Good Friday that we take time to look again at Calvary. And of course, the account of Calvary is found in the Gospels, and the Gospels will give us the facts of the crucifixion, uh, the very specific events that took place. But when we look in the book of Psalms, and especially these Psalms of David, like Psalm 22 and Psalm 69, which are clearly messianic Psalms, which were written 1,000 years before Christ was born in Bethlehem. And yet these Psalms take us beyond just the facts of the crucifixion, but enable us to enter into the feelings of the crucified one. And so we're going to be taking a little bit further than just laying out the sheer facts of the fact that Jesus died on Calvary and getting to maybe to enter into a little bit of what he experienced there. Now, this psalm, it's, it says at the very top uh, that it's a psalm of David. The inscription at the top of the psalm says it's a psalm of David. And yet what we can say is that the things that David describes, he experienced none of this. Uh, when did they pierce David's hands and feet? When did they cast lots for David's garment? Uh, you see, the events that he's describing, we cannot find anywhere in his life anything that relates to this. And so clearly, this is uh, an example of what we find written in 1 Peter chapter 1. And let me just read these verses, verse 10 and 11, uh, which speaks of the Old Testament prophets. It says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory 
that should follow. And so what we see in this psalm is that the, the spirit of Christ that was in David, that's the Holy Spirit, uh, enabled him uh, a thousand years before the events took place to write about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that is to follow. And what's interesting is that as we look at this psalm, uh, the passage that I read, verses 1 through 21, detail for us the sufferings of Christ. And from 22 uh, down to the end of the chapter to verse 31, we get a glimpse of the glory that should follow. And so that's exactly what David did. Now, what's so remarkable about this is that it's a, it's a very graphic description of crucifixion. And you ask yourself, how could David do this when crucifixion as a method of of execution would not even be invented for another four centuries. As far as historians are aware, uh, the first instances of uh, crucifixion uh, was during the time of the Assyrians in the sixth century uh, before Christ. And so this is written in a thousand years before Christ. Uh, crucifixion came in 600 years before Christ. And so uh, again, it's a remarkable evidence of the inspiration of the scriptures that a man could write about something that was not even invented yet and write it in such clear and graphic details. Long before Paul would preach uh, to the Galatians and set forth Christ crucified among them, and in his preaching, preach in such a way that it was almost like Christ was there and they were witnessing the crucifixion. Well, David did that a thousand years before Paul ever did. And he did it in a song because these Psalms, if you remember, are Israel's hymn book. In fact, the inscription tells us that this Psalm, it was written to the chief musician. And the idea was it's, a, it's the lyrics of a song that should be sung, it's given to the chief musician, and he is supposed to come up with an appropriate tune that would go along with this song. And the Psalms was a way that people uh, kind of kept in mind the truths of God. And so it was Israel's hymn book. And so it's addressed to the chief musician, most likely Asaph. And uh, the interesting thing about the Psalm is that it, it tells us in verse 22, if you wanna just look there for a second, he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And so what it tells us actually is that Christ in resurrection would ultimately become the chief musician, that he would be in the midst of the people of God, amidst, in the midst of the congregation, and he would be the one that draws out praise to God from them. And so in a very real sense, the true chief musician uh, ultimately is Christ in resurrection. He's the one that's in our midst. He's the one that draws out praise from our hearts and worship and adoration. Hopefully that will be our experience this morning as we, or this evening for you as we consider the cross. So of course, uh, the very uh, truth of this referring to Christ in verse 22, where it says, I'll declare thy name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation, will I praise thee, is, is confirmed by the writer to Hebrews. I want you just to look at Hebrews chapter 2, the book of Hebrews chapter 2, just for a second, and we'll see how this psalm is used in the book of Hebrews in verse 11 and 12 of chapter 2. It says, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Clearly speaking of the Lord Jesus and really quoting directly, I'll declare thy name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee in the midst of the church will I praise thee so that's where we get our verification that this psalm is clearly 
applied to Jesus, the Messiah, because the writer to the Hebrews applies this psalm directly and says the Lord is that chief musician. Now, just again, another thing about the inscription written at the top of the psalm, it says to the chief musician upon Ijaleth Shehar. And that phrase, Ijaleth Shehar, it, it means hind of the morning. Elsewhere in our Old Testament, Ijaleth is translated as a, a hind or uh, a, a deer. A, a hind is a, a deer, a, a male deer. Uh, and Shehar speaks of the morning. Uh, and it's translated that way in the Old Testament. So if we think of it this way, a uh, hind of the morning, uh, a, a deer, uh, if you like, a male deer that is seen in the morning. Now, so the question is, what is this all about? Why does he mention that? And I'm going to give you two possibilities uh, that have been put forth as to what this really means. Uh, it refers, some suggest, to the the early light preceding the dawn of the morning. And uh, as the sun's rays begin to come up at first light, uh, it's like the horns of a male deer uh, that uh, is being seen. And so the, the thought is that when the chief musician is to write a tune to go along with this psalm, that it, it, it can't be all kind of bleak and dark, although the first part of the psalm is like a night scene. It is very dark, it's the crucifixion, but the psalm doesn't end with the crucifixion. There's the glorious daylight of resurrection seen in the psalm as well when we get from verse 22 to the end. And so he says, you might start the music a bit like a funeral dirge, you know, kind of dark and heavy, but don't end it that way. It's not a night in which there's no end. There's a daylight. There's the, the, the sunrise. And so it needs to end, uh, if you like. It might start kind of dark and heavy, but it's to end like a hallelujah chorus. That's how it's to end, uh, with the bright, glorious sunrise of Christ risen from the dead. And so that's the thought, uh, uh, one suggestion that has been made. Another suggestion is this heart or, or male deer uh, are often uh, referred to in the poetical books as applied to Christ. And of course, a, a deer is a very beautiful, graceful looking animal. And in this psalm, we've got a lot of animals. You've got bulls of Bashan, uh, you, you have dogs, uh, uh, that are, uh, and you have a, a, a unicorn, which is like a wild ox. And so the picture is this beautiful, uh, graceful deer surrounded by its enemies. And in the first morning light, uh, as it were, attacking uh, <clears throat> this animal surrounding it, uh, being pursued by hunters and uh, these, the bulls, the roaring lion, uh, the dogs, uh, all these adversaries uh, are out to kill the victim. And so that certainly would be appropriate as we consider Christ surrounded by his enemies, described as these wild beasts out to kill their graceful, beautiful victim. So as we've already mentioned, the, the first 21 verses uh, is the first part of the psalm, which speaks of the sufferings of Christ. And some have suggested it's to call it the sob, because it's, it's this, this kind of heart-rending cry in the first part. And it's, the emphasis is on verse two. Uh, it says, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And the idea is that this, this sufferer is crying out, but his cry is not heard. There's silence from heaven. The heavens are, are like brass. There's no, there's no help coming to him. He's suffering alone. He's crying out for help and there's no help for him. And yet from verse 21, which is where the whole psalm turns, we, we move from the sob to the song where he, he's leading worship, leading praise in the midst of the congregation. And notice the turning point. It says, save me from the lion's mouth. It says, for thou hast heard. Verse 24, 
He hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. And so the song is connected with the fact that God did finally hear his cry. After he had drunk the bitter cup, of uh, being made to be sin for us and, and being punished on our behalf. Then uh, after he had died, he cried out and in resurrection, uh, he was heard and risen from the grave. So as we uh, look at this uh, first section, which is we're gonna think about, uh, we think of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. And these sufferings described for us are gonna show his sufferings in the totality of his humanity. Uh, we believe without question that the Lord Jesus was God manifest in flesh. He was fully God and fully man. And I wanna just read a verse from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, that gives us a, a, a little glimpse of what man is, the makeup of man. And man is called a tripartite being, three parts to man. It says, the very God of peace, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, sanctify you wholly or completely. I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as the Apostle Paul describes man, he talks about three entities that make up man. He, man is, is not just a body. Uh, he's also a spirit and a soul in this body. And the Lord Jesus, as fully man, suffered on Calvary. And the thought is that as we consider these dimensions of man, we get them all in this psalm. In verses 1 through 3, it's his suffering in spirit. Uh, the, the spirit of the Lord Jesus suffering on the cross. In 4 through 13, it's his soul suffering that we're going to get a glimpse of. And then in verses 15 through 21, we're going to focus on his physical suffering in body, and all of them are going to be described. What is another, just an interesting thought before we dive into the text is that in both the suffering and in the glory that will follow, we find Jesus in the midst. And so in the suffering section, uh, he's surrounded by the assembly of the wicked, it's notice uh, it says verse 16 for dogs have compassed me the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me they pierce my hands and my feet so you get the picture of there's christ on the cross and he is surrounded by the assembly of the wicked when we see him in his glorified condition notice again he's in the midst verse 22 I'll declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. Hebrews, in the midst of the church, will I praise thee. And the idea is that God always wants his son to be in the center of everything. He's surrounded by the wicked in the first part in his sufferings. And in his glory, he's surrounded by the assembly of the righteous. And he's always in the center. No matter where you find him, God always puts him in the center. And of course, he wants to have center stage in our lives. Psalm 22 is part of a trilogy of messianic psalms. Uh, 22, 23, 24 all speak of the Messiah. And they've been cleverly put in this way. Psalm 22 is the cross. Psalm 20. Three is the crook, the shepherd's crook, if you like. Psalm 24 is the crown. It's speaking of him being the king of glory. Uh, in Psalm 22, he's the substitute for sinners. In Psalm 23, he's the shepherd, the good shepherd. And in Psalm 24, he's the sovereign. He's the king of glory. Psalm 22 emphasizes grace, God's grace to sinners in that Jesus died in our place. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, Psalm 23 is guidance. Uh, this, this good shepherd is going to lead us into uh, great paths uh, and uh, good pasture. And then Psalm 24 is glory. Who is the king of glory, the Lord of hosts? 
Psalm 22, we've got the thorns, and 23, we've got the table. Uh, he spreads a table before me. Psalm 24, you've got the throne, this one who is the king of glory seated on the throne. And there's lots more we could say. We, for sake of time, we're going to stop there uh, concerning that, uh, these trilogies concerning the Messiah. But let's think about him suffering in spirit. What do we mean by the spirit of man? Spirit of man is, is that part of man that relates to God. It's the God conscious part of man. Uh, for instance, uh, just to highlight that, that, that our, the human spirit is that part of man that deals with God. Romans 8 and verse 16 would tell us uh, how true this is. Romans 8 verse 16 speaks of the Holy Spirit. It says the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So that the spirit of man is that part of him that deals and relates to God. And so we see here the sufferings of Christ as it relates to God. And notice it says in verse one, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, the writer to the, of the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, has the Lord Jesus quoting this uh, from the cross. In fact, there were seven things that we know for sure the Lord Jesus said while he was on the cross. And this is one of those seven sayings. And those seven sayings, they divide into three that occurred prior to the darkness. One saying that was in the midst of the darkness during those three hours of darkness that covered the whole earth. And then there are three more sayings after the darkness. And this saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is the only saying, the only thing Jesus says during those three hours of darkness. It's known as the, the holy of holies of the seven sayings. And it shows him uh, as the one who is suffering greatly uh, uh, as the sin bearer and the substitute for our sin in those three hours of darkness. It's very fascinating to me that uh, some have suggested that all of the seven sayings are in this psalm. Uh, others have gone as far as to say that the Lord Jesus on the cross probably quoted the entire first 21 verses of this psalm while he was hanging on the cross. And certainly, as I've looked at it and studied it over the years, I can see clearly five of the seven sayings, and perhaps a, at least an inference to two of the other ones. We won't take time to do that, but we do, do know for sure that this central saying, this holy of holies saying, is described right here in this heart-wrenching cry. And what a cry it is. Uh, it's, it's referring to someone experiencing being forsaken by God, abandoned, left utterly alone. It's a cry of desolation. It's a cry of utter loneliness. My God, my God, why, why hast thou forsaken me? What a heart-rending cry. And notice it, it, it says in verse two, oh my God, I cry in the daytime, thou hearest not. Because remember uh, it, it, his crucifixion, began nine o'clock in the morning. And of course, it was in the daytime, the daylight hours. And in the night season, uh, those three hours of darkness uh, from noon till three in the afternoon, uh, where uh, it was like the night season. Uh, and I'm not silent. So as he endures the cross, as he goes through this, you hear this statement, but thou hearest not. Silence. The heavens are at brass, as brass, this heart-wrenching cry, but there's no answer. And uh, John Nelson Darby, I think, puts it very beautifully. He says, a cry which till the bitter cup had been fully drunk could not be heard. He couldn't be heard. Why? Why was he forsaken of God? Why was the cry not heard? Because during those three hours of darkness, an amazing transaction took place. Second Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way. He that knew no sin 
was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And during those three hours of darkness, all our sins were laid upon him. Jesus bore them on the tree. God who knew them laid them on him. And so we get this graphic picture of the, the Lord Jesus, the one who loved righteousness, hated iniquity, having the iniquity of us all laid upon him. And because he is now made to be sin for us, God can't hear during these three hours because verse three gives us the explanation, but thou art holy, a holy God. Uh, the writer Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk says, God is so holy that he cannot bear to look upon sin. And, and so <laughs> you've got this amazing picture. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. Canst not look upon iniquity. And so while his son is being made to be sin, it's like the father can't look. He can't look and he can't hear and he can't answer. He, Jesus was forsaken of God so that you and I might never be forsaken. One of the great promises of the New Testament, Hebrews 13, verse 5, God says this to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. A child of God will never be abandoned, never be forsaken, because the Lord Jesus took our place on that cross. He took in his own body, the punishment that should have been ours. And he suffered greatly in spirit. He suffered what it was, as it were, to be forsaken of God so that we might never, ever have that experience. He endured that for you and I. Verse 4, it talks about his suffering in soul. And that's the self-conscious part of man, uh, the idea of uh, the emotional part of man, uh, this feeling uh, of the Lord Jesus, of uh, that he went through emotionally, this the sense of rejection, not just uh, by God, but this rejection uh, that he experienced by men as well. Notice it says in verse four, uh, our fathers trusted in thee. Notice the word trust here. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. They cried to thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. And so what he says is that, you know, the martyrs, even they didn't feel forsaken of God because they experienced martyrs' grace, right? They experienced God's grace sufficient for them in their suffering. Uh, those uh, uh, Old Testament saints, uh, they cried to God. He delivered them. Uh, they experienced his help. They experienced his abounding grace. Uh, they trusted he delivered, either enabling them by giving them grace to go through what they went through or by delivering them out of it. And we, we all know the stories of the great deliverances, uh, the, the three men in the fiery furnace, uh, Daniel in the lion's den. We can recount again and again these great deliverances. Uh, they trusted in the, and, and you delivered them. But he says, but I, but I, verse six, am a worm and no man. One of the forgotten I am statements of the Lord Jesus. We know about I am the good shepherd. We know about I am the resurrection and the life. We, we know all those, but, but what about this one? I am a worm and no man. He was not even treated with basic human dignity but with the disdain shown to a worm. The story is told of a, a well-known singer who was asked to sing Isaac Watts, a great classic hymn. Alas, and did my savior bleed, and did my sovereign die, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? And the singer refused on the grounds that it was beneath his dignity to think of himself as a worm. The preacher's response was that one far greater than you took that title as his own. And it is interesting. I remember years ago in Bible college uh, being told by one of the lecturers with great vehemence, beware of wormology. Uh, don't, uh, 
you know, and of course it was in the days where self-image was the big mantra of the day. And, uh, you know, if you don't esteem yourself and it's rubbish, you know, let me tell you this. The bottom line is this. The problem with the world is not low self-esteem. You know what the problem with the world is? We esteemed him not. We don't give enough esteem to the Savior. That's the problem with our world. But nevertheless, concerning the Lord Jesus, he says, yeah, they all cried to, the, to, to thee, uh, the, these Old Testament saints, these martyrs. You delivered them. But he says, as for me, I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Well, what a first statement. Such hate despised of the people, the one that went about doing good, uh, the one that was full of grace and truth was despised of the people. Now, here's the amazing thing. Just, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but the word worm is the word tola. And uh, that word tola, it's very interesting. It's translated as scarlet a number of times in our Bibles, uh, the great verse in Isaiah, come now, let us reason together, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. That word scarlet is the word tola. And the reason is because there's such a creature as a tola worm. And from this tola worm was extracted a scarlet dye. That scarlet dye was even used uh, in the tabernacle uh, for those cloths of scarlet that covered uh, some of the furnishings of the tabernacle. Uh, and so uh, this toller, very interesting, uh, when it was ready to, to lay its eggs, it would attach itself to a tree and it would stay on the tree until it had given birth and then it would die. It would never leave the tree. And what it would do is it would leave on that tree because it because from it comes this scarlet secretion it, the tree would be all scarlet uh, as a result of this uh, this taller worm and some have seen in this a beautiful picture of christ being nailed to the tree dying on a tree uh, his precious blood being shed and as uh, it, it would give birth its its offspring would come out from the the carcass, and we think of the Lord Jesus, the words of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, that he suffered on Calvary, that he might bring many sons to glory. He shed his precious blood, that he might bring many sons to glory. So just a lovely thought concerning that word, tola, the tolly word. Uh, anyway, he's despised, very intense word. Uh, they showed their hatred towards him in very clear ways verse seven all they that see me laugh me uh, to scorn uh, again just uh, none of us enjoy being laughed at i remember my youngest boy paul uh, he's now a young man but when he was little he was uh, he'd say things he was kind of funny he was the funny one in the family he'd always have something witty to say but he sometimes didn't even realize he was being funny and he would say something and his siblings would laugh at him and immediately his bottom lip would come out and he'd begin to cry because uh, he didn't like being laughed at. None of us like being laughed at. Yet when it comes to the Lord Jesus, Matthew's gospel, chapter nine, verse 24 says, they laughed him, the Lord Jesus, to scorn. They shoot out the lip. <clears throat> and again, it's kind of pointing with the bottom lip to him in a very arrogant gesture. Rudely, point look at that, that crazy man over there. That's how they would they would do it. They shook their heads in disgust at him. And th again, the irony is the very one that gave them life, the very one that gave them breath. And here they are, the creator of the universe. Uh, there he is hanging on the cross and they're disdaining him, shaking their heads in disgust at him. It says he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. And again, quoted directly, Matthew 27, 43, as Jesus was on the cross, they're taunting him. He saved others. Let him save himself. Uh, himself he cannot save. And the idea is this, that if the Lord Jesus had saved himself, he couldn't save us. You see, he, it was before the foundation of the world, it was determined that he would suffer 
as the sin bearer and substitute for sin. And as the Lord is on that cross, although he could have called 12 legions of angels, it says he endured the cross, despising the shame, because he knew it was the only way that rebels and wretches like us could ever be redeemed. And so he didn't cry out for the Lord to deliver him. He endured the cross. They, they said uh, he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delights in him. But thou art he, verse 9, that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Tells, him, tells us that the Lord Jesus, when he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, he was born as the, the uh, second man, uh, the last Adam. Uh, he was born into this world as, a, as the dependent man. Just like Adam acted independently of God, the Lord Jesus was that fully dependent man. And it tells him that from, tells us that from birth, uh, he, he trusted and uh, w w delighted in his father. Thou art he that took me out of the womb, thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. And so this idea of his dependent life, dependent on the father moment by moment, always did those things that pleased the father, lived in absolute dependence. Now, again, this is not David. This is not David's experience because David, when he speaks about his birth, he says in Psalm 51, verse 5, behold, I, he says, was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Like the rest of the human race, David was born with that rebellious nature that he received from his family. And so he uh, certainly was not described in these terms. <clears throat> Verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. And again, all his disciples, we read, forsook him and fled. He's alone. Uh, there's no help from heaven. Heaven is silent. There's no help from those that he had invested three and a half years of his ministry into them. He is completely abandoned. There's none to help. Uh, he looked for some to take pity, he says in uh, uh, Lamentations chapter 1, verse 12 and 30, and found none. He's there alone, and yet he's surrounded. And it tells us those that surrounded him. Bulls of Bashan, it says have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan. And this is referred to as uh, Bashan was a, a beautiful area uh, east of the Jordan River, uh, kind of just near the Golan Heights today, beautiful area for uh, fertile land, especially for cattle. And the cattle there were, were particularly healthy and lively. And in Amos chapter four, verse one, uh, the prophet calls the leaders of Israel because of their stubbornness, he calls them bulls of Bashan. <laughs> and, and this is the idea that the religious leaders, you can see them there, uh, Ananias, Caiaphas, uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, veins sticking out on their necks, uh, surrounding the cross, taunting him. They've, they've cried out, crucify him. And he's surrounded by these bulls of Bashan. Uh, they gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. Of course, we know that behind them, the Lord had said to them that you are of your father, the devil. And behind their hatred, their vehement hatred of the Savior was none other than the roaring lion himself. Remember Satan, 1 Peter 5, 8. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And no question that he would have been there at Calvary, uh, as it were, inspiring, whipping up the mob in their hatred of the Lord Jesus. He says, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. Again, uh, we're, we're moving on now to his physical sufferings poured out like water. Some suggest that yeah, as he, in those, those early hours, as the sun is getting hotter and here he is hanging there, uh, just the sheer stress of crucifixion uh, would have caused excessive uh, perspiration, uh, physical exhaustion, his, his enemy, uh, his energy uh, poured out, uh, just leaving nothing. I'm poured out like water. 
All his bones are out of joint. You know how careful the scripture is? It doesn't say they were broken because uh, John 19, 36, quoting from the book of Exodus and the Passover lamb, it talks about not a bone of his body shall be broken. And so although there was great disjointed and contortions connected with crucifixion uh, and the agony of it, uh, it just, just the process of nailing him to a cross, of hoisting him up, and then dropping him into that hole in the ground, and just the, the sheer physical jolt uh, would have caused his bones to be out of joint, but not one of them was broken. It says that his heart uh, was melted like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. One medical doctor suggests that the, the, the tremor uh, uh, the sheer tremor on the heart of the Lord Jesus of going through this would have resulted in a ruptured heart. And the very fact that when they put that spear in his side and blood and water flowed out from the side would, would give that uh, the, the, the heart had been under such incredible stress. And so <clears throat> the Lord Jesus suffering physically uh, in, tremendously, uh, in, in his heart, there's just the sheer stress and pressure on the heart. Verse 15, it says, His strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me to the dust of death. Talking about the incredible thirst that the Lord Jesus would have had. Uh, like a, a pot, uh, you know, kind of that it, once it's, it's made, it's kind of moist and then it's put into the furnace. And in the furnace, all the moisture dries out. And the Lord Jesus is going through the furnace of the affliction uh, from man and from God. And the idea is just the intense thirst. He cries out, doesn't he, on the cross, I thirst. And, uh, of course, uh, we think of the rich man uh, in Hades. And we're reminded that uh, he just wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue because he was in agony in this flame. And you get the idea, the Lord Jesus is the sinner's substitute. He's enduring, as it were, all of the wrath of God poured out upon him. And, and he cries out, I thirst, so that we might not have to cry in Hades and then in the lake of fire out for thirst, because he truly bore our place on the cross. He says, dogs have compassed me. The jet, that's the term for Gentiles. Remember the Lord Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. And uh, he said, we don't give the children's food to dogs. Uh, it wasn't talking about pedigree dogs. It's talking about wild packs of roaming dogs. And he said, dogs, the Gentiles, have compassed me about. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. You just get this idea of Calvary surrounded, the religious leaders, the bulls of Bashan, the Gentile dogs, the Roman soldiers, uh, the, the assembly of the wicked. And, and Colossians tells us too that, that all the demonic forces were there at the cross as well. All the hideous demonic creatures, Satan, the roaring lion, all surrounding him at the cross. And then it says, I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me as he's hanging there, uh, just stared at the, the shame of it all. Crucified, uh, often naked, the shame of, of him staring at him, of them staring at them. It says, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. The reason that he's naked is because his clothing became the spoil of the Roman soldiers. His outer garment being uh, divided between them and his inner garment, because it was a seamless robe, uh, well, they gambled for that. And so he was, he was there in all nakedness and shame, just like Adam and Eve, remember, when they were kicked out of the garden, they were naked and ashamed. And, of course, the Lord clothed them with animal skins, a, a, a an animal had to die, its blood shed, so they could be clothed. And again, we're reminded of the Lord Jesus that here we are in our nakedness and shame, but he suffered in our stead that 
we might be clothed in his righteousness. Be that, that far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver me my soul from the sword. That word sword, it speaks of capital punishment. Uh, Romans 13, about the, uh, the governor, government, that they do not bear the sword in vain. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling. That word darling, it's literally my only one, my only begotten. Deliver your only begotten one from the power of the dog, from the power of the Gentile authority. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. And of course, that's the turning point in the psalm. After he has paid that penalty, after he's drunk the bitter cup, he is heard and he's seen in resurrection, bringing praise in the midst of the congregation of the righteous. And we notice that he talks about my brethren. Verse 22, I'll declare thy name to my brethren. In John 20, verse 17, uh, he says to Mary, go tell my brethren and your brethren. How wonderful. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. He's going to be in the midst of us. He is in the midst of us, leading praise and adoration. And of course, his work is an amazing work. It encompasses his brethren, uh, those disciples that he died for. It includes the seed of Jacob. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, fear him. All ye the seed of Israel, there's a day coming when all Israel will be saved. They'll, the work of Christ will be applied to them when they look on him whom they have pierced. And notice verse 27, all the end of the world, ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And here we are. I'm in America, not even thought about in the days when Christ was crucified. Here you are in Malaysia, in the East, all the ends of the world shall remember isn't it wonderful that here we are remembering him remembering the one that died for us verse 31 they shall come and shall declare his righteousness to a people that shall be born that he hath done this literally it is finished they shall declare his righteousness to a people that shall be born that he have done this, that it is finished. And aren't we glad today that somebody took the trouble to declare to us the righteous work of the Savior, dying on the cross, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Oh, what he suffered there on the cross. Can we live in different lives in the light of what he endured? The Moravian brethren they were so taken by what Christ had done for them that they made it their goal to win for the lamb that was slain the reward of his suffering. They had this mission to tell the world about what Jesus did on Calvary and to think that he did it for people like you and I. May God encourage us as we think of the great work of the Savior, the Lord Jesus, suffering there on Calvary. Amen. Amen.